Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup entrepreneurs and the VCs and investors that fund them. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SVAs, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing organization for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Tonight, we're going to be exploring an area that I get asked about frequently, which is what are the roles of the various players in venture capital firms, particularly general partners, venture partners, and entrepreneurs in residence. And to help me with this this, this evening, I have with me David Aslin of Nexit Ventures, who's had a pretty interesting track record in this field, um, who's going to help me explain how this goes. So David, thank you very much for coming along to this. Good to see you here. Well, good to be here, Chris. Thanks. So to help us set the scene a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about your background and to how you ended up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, well, like most people in venture, it was uh, a long and convoluted background uh -huh. before I got here. But briefly, um, worked in large corporations, Hewlett Packard in my case, um, mm -hmm. went up through the ranks there, then ran three small companies successfully and decided I needed to do something different and got into venture as a result of uh, that small company experience. And that led me to 3i, since this was all happening in Europe, uh, as largest, uh, at the time, largest venture organization in Europe. Um, and when I got the opportunity to come to Silicon Valley in 2000, I grabbed it with both hands, became a general partner with 3i, leaving their early stage investing. But 3i moved away from early stage investing, mm -hmm. and so I had the opportunity to think about, well, did I want to be a general partner? or go and be a venture partner, which is what I've ended up deciding to do. So uh, it's very much you know, germane to this subject this evening. Absolutely, yeah. which is why I asked yeah, you to right. come along, because uh, right. you get involved in this from, from, from wide range of angles. Right. So a lot of people I meet at SFA's meetings say, I want to get into venture capital, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to become a GP. You, you made that move. Mm -hmm. How typically does that happen? I don't think there's a typical. Um, but there are some factors that you can make it more likely because it's a very hard industry to get into even before it was starting to uh, reduce in scale as it is right now during mm -hmm. this downturn. Um, one is big company and small company experience, and I had both. Mm -hmm. I, had, I started a company with just myself and two engineers, and I'd run multi-hundred person, multi-hundreds of million dollar organizations within a big company, HP. So mm -hmm. there's one piece. Another piece is make money for your investors. So if you are in a small company, be successful, be part of the team. You don't have to be CEO, but be part of the team that is known to have been a factor in making that small business successful. Okay. And lastly, you know, implicit in all that is some operating experience. That's a bias of mine. You'll find people who are in venture that haven't got operating experience, but I happen to think it really counts when you're building a company. And, and okay, uh, let me explore a little bit of that. Yeah. Because there's, there's one school of thought, thought that says um, the Sequoia mm -hmm. type approach where they're very heavy on the finance side and lighter on the, 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 the operating mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. um, they're one of the most successful yes. in, 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 in Silicon Valley in right. the world. Um, whereas some of the more operation, operating experience oriented funds mm -hmm. have been less successful. Right. Any comments with regard to that? Well, I think you know, it's very difficult to compare apples and apples in this business because you know, the way Sequoia does business is very successful for them. There are other large, big-name funds that have a lot of operating partners who've been very successful. I mean, Kleiner Perkins has a okay. lot of operating guys in it, for example. Right. So for the big guys, I think uh, you, know, you could argue maybe the experience doesn't matter so much. If you're in the middle ground or if you're in the boutique-scale fund, as I am, then you better be bringing some real value in addition to the dollar because why else would an entrepreneur want to take your money rather than one of the big names? Because they think you can help to build the company. Okay, so within the VC and engaging with a startup, what's the role of the GP? Well, the GP's role really is two things. There's the inside role and the outside role. And the outside role is what the entrepreneur will see, which is this is the guy who comes at some point in the process to work through the idea that they, that firm might invest in my company. Mm -hmm. um, often uh, in the big, bigger firms, you'll find that maybe 
you see the general partner at the very start of the process and you don't see them again for a while because there's an army of associates or principals or vice presidents or whatever they're called who are doing the diligence work to move the deal along in terms of their thinking within the firm. But the GP ultimately is the person responsible for presenting that deal to the partnership, mm -hmm. getting the partnership to agree to do it if they decide that's what they want to do, uh, and then is responsible for deriving value from that after the investment is made. So they're on the hook for the deal all the way through from decision to exit. Now, just to help a little bit of understanding here, when they've made an investment, they're probably a board member. Mm -hmm. Is the startup and the entrepreneur working for the investor, or is the investor working for the startup and the entrepreneur? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, it's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at the way things are structured, you know, legally, um, you know, the uh, shareholder value is something that the uh, the entrepreneur should be thinking about creating. So, in that sense, they're fully aligned with their investors. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, they can't move forward without more financing in most cases, um, and therefore the investor has a lot of uh, weight in the, in the way in which the company decisions are taken. Now, a good investor will understand the dividing line between taking the decision for the CEO mm -hmm. and making their point of view very clearly understood as the CEO weighs up their options. Um, so the, you have to be thinking at all times as a, as a general partner about how to uh, influence the direction of the company. Because the moment you cross that line into taking control from the entrepreneur, then you're lost. Right? So I think that that's one of the real challenges for a GP is, mm -hmm. to, is to learn how to influence because many of us who've been operating guys are used to having full control and you have to learn to give that up. The other factor that is complex in a GP's life and its relationship and their relationship with a startup company is they're actually wearing typically at least two hats, maybe three or four. Board member, mm -hmm. so they have fiduciary responsibilities as a board member, as every board member does. Investor, so they have to think about the investment responsibilities they have in that company, but also as a representative of their firm. And the investor agenda may be not directly aligned with the board agenda. So you have those two separate hats. In some companies, you may find that that board member from a venture firm also was an angel investor in an earlier round, if their firm allows them to do that. Um, they may be even a founder of the company that's moved to the venture side. Mm -hmm. So you can have all these multiple hats in the GP. Uh, and as an entrepreneur, it pays to understand, you know, which hat is he wearing now? <laughs> That's pretty complicated. <laughs> yes, and and it I, is. I it can is. see yeah. situations where um, there's, there's a struggle yes. as to are they aligned with doing the best job for the startup versus for their firm or for their personal? Uh, uh, absolutely. And the, the potential for conflicts of interest is always there. It's how you manage them hmm. and how overt and communicative you are with the entrepreneur that gets you through this, the situations where there is a, diff a difference of view that you take as a board member where you have very specific responsibilities or as a general partner where you have responsibilities to your fund and your fund's investors. Right. Um, so the conflict is built into the system that we have of creating value here in the valley. Hmm. So it's how you deal with those conflicts and how you manage that with the entrepreneur. But it pays for the entrepreneur to understand that you know, there are many different roles around that board table, not just that a board member. For each person around the table, understanding their motivations and their perspective right. is really important. So uh, that, that's a key, key point. It becomes um, a skill that the startup founders and certain CEO has to learn, yes. which is to understand what is really motivating the individual board members. Right, right. And it's not going to come up every day in every decision, mm. So, but you are going to find some crunch points around, you know, should we sell the company now or later? Mm -hmm. um, for example, you know, the investors may say, well, let's hang on. I mean, there's much more value down the road. Let's keep going. The entrepreneur may say, well, you know, this is several million dollars in my pocket. Why don't we just, you know, sell it now because we think we can. Mm -hmm. um, and vice versa, you know, the CEO that wants to go all the way to IPO and the investors are saying, 
this hasn't been the easiest ride. I think if we could just get a reasonable return on our money, it would be a good time to uh, to uh, you know have the company in different ownership. Okay, so we could obviously spend some more time on this. Yeah, that's a separate topic. Yeah, but but let's let's move on to some of the other players that that, that entrepreneurs come across. The first of which, let's talk about the role of the venture partner. Right. Right. And, and, and that's a role, as you explained, you're, you're, you're currently performing at the moment. Yeah. What's the role of the venture partner? It's all over the map around different firms, but there are some common threads. So a venture partner is going to be someone that is already known to the firm when they get appointed, which means that they've likely either helped them build a startup or two or three, or has been part of the firm and is reducing their role within the firm or has been on a board with one of the one or more of the firm's partners. So they're very a very well-known quantity. Um, but the difference is they're not a general partner today. They may never be a general partner. So there's a number of things that apply. If you join as a venture partner, your responsibility may include no doing of deals, but helping the general partners get deals done or helping the general partners uh, build value in the companies where they have made an investment. Okay. That's one case. Another case would be, let's try you out as a venture partner, and if you demonstrate further value to the firm, then there is a track for you to become a general partner. And for people earlier in their career that you see who have become venture partners, that's often the case. They're on a partner track, and it's a try and buy, and it's a couple of years you know, let's see how this works out and whether we all get on together and this is going to work from a sort of uh, firm chemistry and value build point of view mm -hmm. and then we'll take a general partner. Okay, so just to summarize that, you've, you've got to be well known to the, to the venture firm in some way. Yes. Probably yes. through involvement with one of the portfolio yep. companies. Absolutely. Um, you can surface deals. Yeah. Uh, but you don't make the deal decision as to whether to invest or not? Typically not, though there are venture partners where, you know, there's, um, there's one of the guys at Alloy Ventures that I was speaking to, and he said, the reason I'm a venture partner is I don't want to be on the general partner treadmill. I'd like to do a deal every couple of years, not a couple of deals a year. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be involved in partnership politics or managing the partnership as a fund. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to do deals. Okay. Um, and I think I can add some value and I'll do occasional deals. So some firms will, will have that role where somebody who's you know, typically later in their career wants to do things at a, a slightly reduced rate um, but can still bring significant experience and value to the equation. Okay, so what value do these people bring to the startup team? Often they've had startup experience themselves. They've mm -hmm. been there, they've sat in the seat of the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So they can provide the guidance, the coaching, the mentoring, all those things to, to help the entrepreneur as they get into situations where guidance and help might be called for. Mm -hmm. um, they may have come from uh, large companies, so they have executive contacts that are relevant to the startup, can help open doors. They may uh, be willing to drop in as executives to fill in a gap. You know, we don't have a marketing guy yet, we can't afford one full time, so the venture partner takes the marketing role for a period of months or maybe a year or so mm -hmm. uh, to help build the company um, until the recruitment takes place and their role is, is, is taken over by that person. So it's kind of whatever it takes to help create more value in the startup and do the things the startup needs to do on very re limited resources. So they're okay. another resource for the startup. Okay, so we know general partners already um, share in, in, in the, um, the success mm -hmm. of a startup. Do venture partners share in the success? If they're doing deals, almost certainly. Okay. If they don't actually have a defined percentage of the carry in the firm, mm -hmm. they may have a deal by deal carry. So they are motivated the same way a general partner is, just at a lesser rate. So their motivations, you know, coming back to the question mm. of what should the entrepreneur look out for, yes. their motivations will be very, very similar to a general partner if they've done the deal. If they're the yeah. sort that is more what I'd call an operating partner, and some firms actually use that title, mm -hmm. and they're the hands-on, the guy you can call on to pitch in when you know this small team has more than it can handle, um, and they're not doing anything around the deal doing part of, uh, of being a VC, uh, then they may or may not have direct alignment. They'll often be encouraged to 
maybe put some money themselves into the startup, or they'll get options from the startup. So they'll have some closer alignment with the startup itself, perhaps, than the firm. Okay, but they're in general they're motivated for the success of the oh, startup. Oh, absolutely, and absolutely. They're more than willing to get their hands dirty. Y yeah, absolutely. To try and help yes, it along. Yeah, they're highly motivated to do that. They don't do it for the they do it for the fun, but they don't do it without there being some reward at the end of the day that says you know the the fun was worthwhile. Okay, <laughs> so. all right. Yeah. So then there's the EIR, the executive in residence, sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes the, the executive in residence, but let, let, let's yes, look at yes, the, yeah. the, the entrepreneur in residence angle. Yeah. What, what's, what's the role there? So again, it's all over the map. Everybody uses these terms very loosely. So I'll try and just sort of pick out the high, the, the high points and the common factors around this. So uh, often this is an executive who's been successful in a startup, has made money uh, for the firm, and they've asked them to come in and cook up their new idea within the firm. Mm -hmm. While they're doing that, they'll see some deal flow come, come through the firm. They'll see some expertise come through the firm in, in the form of other startups from which they may be able to learn about what's going on in different sectors to fill out their next proposition with a, a better understanding of the sort of things that are going on. Not taking ideas from the other guys, I mean, that, that wouldn't be appropriate, but just get developing an understanding of the sort of things that's going on in a broad sense. Um, and so there's a very clear track. Come in cook up your next idea, we may or may not fund it. That's the thing to understand about it, is there's usually zero commitment from the firm that they will fund the idea once you've created it. Um, so, you know, I've seen situations where a guy who made a lot of money in uh, software, you know, creates the next great clean tech uh, mm -hmm. opportunity. You know, most funds are doing clean tech now, but before that was true, you know, the fund can't, can't fund, fund this new uh, new idea because they don't do clean tech, they don't understand it, they don't want to do that, it's not part of their remit. So that's why there's usually no commitment that whatever the idea is um, gets funded by the firm that's housing the EIR. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, they have hopefully some smart minds around the firm that can help the EIR with the idea and, and, and in turn the EIR can educate the firm on some aspects of what they know and what they've learned from their, their prior career. So. W w What's the, the likelihood of an EIR coming across um, what they think is a, is, a, is a very smart idea from a team that, that could maybe benefit from their involvement? Right. Is, is there the temptation from an EIR to want to be involved in that? Is that a good thing? What, how yeah, does that I, I, play I, out? I, think it's, I think it's all good because this, this is a matching game that we're mm -hmm. in, right? So the, the really successful companies have great teams. So if you've got a great entrepreneur that's in residence mm -hmm. and a team comes through with a really great idea but the team isn't quite complete, why wouldn't you put the two of them together? I mean, it just, just makes sense to give that company a better shot at success and give that IR, EIR a, uh, a platform from which they can you know, build, build that company. Okay. And so it's, it's often a question of, you know, the EIR has ideas, but in the end, maybe they don't actually pursue any of those ideas, mm -hmm. right? Um, because they do spot something that comes through the firm or comes from another firm whilst they're in this period after one startup and before the next one. Okay. So one of the really exciting things about Silicon Valley is this idea of serial entrepreneurship. Yes. Most of the areas that would as in the world that would aspire to be like Silicon Valley don't have the serial entrepreneurs to benefit from. We do. Um, and this is how it happens. And you need a breather after you've done the startup. So often the EIR is, you know, I'm, an, I'm on furlough for a little while, <laughs> just figuring stuff out. Okay. And then when I re-emerge, it'll be with a new startup. So uh, part of what you said there was, was, was that the role of the EII is to, is to get a deeper understanding of a p particular area. It can be. It can so be, yes. To be able to help the firm. So they're, they're looking at a number of startups. Some startups might see that as stealing my idea. What's, what's yeah, your... I, I don't, I d you know, the valley is such a small village when it comes down to it. If somebody started to try and do that, I think, you know, their reputation would be shot pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think that's a real risk. I mean, by its nature, venture sees lots and lots of businesses all going after the same space. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunately, as an industry, we often all invest in the same space like lemmings, but right. that's, another, <laughs> that's another discussion too. But um, you're going to see, you know, half a dozen people all going after mobile social networking mm -hmm. if you're with a firm like Nexit that does a lot of mobile, right? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that we're going to steal ideas from one and another and put them together and you know, make, something, make, make something out of that? 
No, it's an education process of seeing people attack a particular problem that the world probably already knows about. Mm -hmm. the, the, the talent is in finding the right way to solve that problem. So if you've seen a number of different ways of approaching it, it doesn't mean to say you're going to pick somebody else's idea and run with it and try and compete with them head to head. But you've, there's been a two-way education process because that would be the situation where the EIR would have experience that was relevant to those startups. Right. So again, thinking about would a, would a founding team em, em, embrace and welcome um, an EIR into their into their fault, ex, you know, expose them to what's going right, on? Right. That would tend to be a positive thing. Yeah, uh, it else. would tend to be positive. Yep. But of course, do your diligence. Yep. Figure out you know what's the guy planning, what's his motivation, why why would he want to talk to us? And if you get comfortable that this is all about you know we're, we're coming together because there is a fit between the EIR and this new new uh, new startup and the two should get together great if it looks like it's a fishing trip uh, that's getting rather uncomfortable then you know make sure you've asked those questions early in the process so you haven't given too much away i haven't seen much of that happen mm -hmm. but you know it could it could happen so mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur be really careful that you understand what the agenda is. Okay, so in fact, well, the description of all these roles, mm -hmm. there's, there's a, a predominantly positive outcome. Absolutely. Everybody's on the same a, a, a agenda to make the startup su successful. Yeah. But there are some caveats, mm -hmm. and it behooves the startup team, the entrepreneur, to do, do due diligence yeah, absolutely. on the people they're engaging with. Yeah as much as I'm sure the investors are doing due diligence back into the, the, t the, the, the startup start team. team. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and the, the, the EIR role is probably the least likely where there's going to be direct engagement with a, with a startup. It's only okay. where there's this beneficial match. The venture partner role is a much more hands-on, typically, s situation, mm -hmm. and therefore it's much more about value build and direct alignment with the investor because of the share of the action they get through the carry, typically. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's a more beneficial situation. So the one thing the entrepreneur should not be confused about is, why haven't I got a GP on my deal? Does that mean my deal's going nowhere? That's a good point, right. yeah. If there's a venture partner on it, mm -hmm. first of all, find out, can you do deals? Mm -hmm. Will the you know, and is there a track record of you having done deals? If you've been with the firm a while, you know, are you just saying you can do deals but you never do? But, or have you actually done one? Mm -hmm. um, and if the answer is yes, you know, my role in the firm includes doing of deals, they should be of the same value to you as a GP. Now, different firms are different politics and, you know, different weight of votes around the table, and so there's probably still some wrinkles in there to think about. But it's not like when you get the situation where, you know, you try and get into the firm and all you can get is an associate. And with all respect to the associates, there's some very bright and smart associates out there. They don't have the decision-making power. They don't have the influence in the firm as a general partner or a venture partner would do. So being bounced always to the associate can be a red flag. Being, being bounced, as it were, to a venture partner is not necessarily a red flag. In fact, it's unlikely to be a red flag. It's part of the process of getting someone with real deep experience, because most venture partners are deeply experienced, deep experience applied to your proposition. Okay. You, and you, you have mentioned venture partners, so we've got, we got a little bit of time we can, yeah. we can touch on that. Sorry, the, the, the associates. Yeah. Um, so it seems like for all the other roles, general partner, venture partner, EIR, yeah. you've got to have some prior exposure to the fund Mm -hmm. uh, probably um, in one of the portfolio companies. You've got to have some success yeah. under the belt. Or you had a big success with another firm's another money firm. and you happened to want to go spend your yeah. time with these guys. Right? So, so <laughs> how do you get onto the associate track and do, do, associate, uh, do, do associates eventually work their way up to being general partners? Or? It, it varies again a lot from firm to firm. And so you know, if I'm uh, mentoring an associate, as I've done a number of times, mm -hmm. it's you know, figure out, is there a partner track? Is, is, is there a history of, of this process? taking place. It's a long track. Um, some partners, some uh, firms will say to be an associate, you know, you have to be post MBA, startup experience, and, and, and before you join. So you're talking about somebody who's probably, you know, he or she's going to be at least late 20s mm -hmm. uh, kind of age before they come in, maybe, maybe early 30s, uh, because they've got a weight of experience and postgraduate education. Mm -hmm. 
Um, others will say, no, 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 we want to, we want actually, what we want is, you know, the energy and raw talent mm -hmm. and the demographic of the pre-MBA person. You know, they've done their first degree, they've maybe done a year or two of work, but no more. So they've got lots of energy and they're very close to the young dem demographic. Right. So in the mobile world that, uh, that Nexit inhabits, you know, we, we think about, well, we're the wrong demographic altogether for mobile social <laughs> networking, some of the gaming <laughs> propositions, you know, some of the, the weird and wonderful phone designs, right. all those kinds of things. Let's find a 24 year old and test it with them, see right. what they think about the proposition. Okay. And some firms will bring in associates to be part of that process. All right, so unfortunately we're, we're, we're running out of time, we've only got okay. a minute left, uh, but uh, um, do you have any last advice for somebody who's looking to break into the venture capital world? Well, the, the way in is, th is through uh, the associate level most typically. So, you know, figure out what the firm wants and needs at its associate level and join while you're relatively young. Either that or wait till right to the end of your career and become a venture partner. Ah, <laughs> okay, because you've got the experience. Because you've got the experience to bring to bear and you've got some uh, something different to offer. Right. Uh, getting in as a GP is a complete crapshoot. Okay. Right? <laughs> and I All can't right. say it any clearer than that. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been a very interesting conversation here. I hope that uh, everybody has found this uh, useful and, and informative. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. We could talk an awful lot more. Unfortunately, I have to wrap up. So um, this is good night from the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur and look forward to seeing you again next month.